The unloading of the sardine catch is a daily ritual in the small town of Sinas, along Portugal's Atlantic coast. It is a ritual that goes back hundreds of years. In fact, one can almost imagine the young son of the local governor witnessing something similar more than 500 years ago. But that young man wouldn't stay in Sinas. He moved on to bigger things, becoming the town's claim to fame. Vasco da Gama might not be flattered by the way his descendants chose to honor him, but there isn't a great deal we know about him. He was born here in the late 1460s, but the exact date or year no one knows with certainty. The son of Sinus governor, he grew up in the castle that still dominates the town, but no one knows how long he stayed here. He probably had some seafaring experience, but why he came to command the first voyage to India is not entirely clear. There must have been something about this man that impressed Portugal's King Manuel. Whatever the reasons, his selection earned Vasco da Gama immortality in the history books. This book of the fleets to India is very important because it's one of only two known copies where the fleets have been illustrated. Professor Inácio Guerreiro is a leading authority on the enterprise of India. Naturally, a book on the fleets to India should have the fleet of Vasco da Gama on its first page, which was the first to head that way. The fleet consisted of four large square-sailed ships, or nows. In these drawings, we can see a flag with a cross, which indicates that this was Vasco da Gama's, the commander's ship. The ship São Rafael was built for this trip as well, and its commander was Paulo da Gama. Aside from this, there were two other ships, one of which was commanded by Nicolau Coelho. It was called the Berrio, and a store ship led by Gonzalo Nunes, which later had to be burned in Mossel Bay in South Africa. In all, the fleet carried some 150 people, but only one of their accounts survives. Only one eyewitness account is known, attributed to Álvaro Velho, who was a soldier on one of the ships. It is a diary of sorts in which Velho wrote the most important events of the voyage, though he didn't do so every day. It is an extremely important account because it is the only one known and because it provides us with a very accurate description of Vasco da Gama Street, especially in the outbound leg, which is more detailed than the return. Unfortunately, Velho is not very elaborate about the first part of the voyage, quickly describing how the fleet made for Santiago in the Cape Verde Islands. After repairing the rigging and provisioning, the ship set out again in early August. What followed still ranks as a very impressive nautical feat. On Thursday, August 3rd, we left in an easterly direction. On August 18th, when about 700 miles from Santiago, the Captain Major's main yard broke, and we lay to under foresail and lower mainsail for two days. On the 22nd of the same month, when going south by west, we saw many birds. On the approach of night, they flew vigorously to the southeast, as if making for the land. On Friday, October 27th, we saw many whales, as well as dolphins and seals. On Wednesday, November 1st, we perceived many indications of the proximity of land. On Saturday the 4th of the same month, we had soundings in 110 fathoms, and at 9 o'clock we sighted the land. In the course of the day, we tacked so as to come close to the land, but as we failed to identify it, we again stood out to sea. On Tuesday, we returned to the land, which we found to be low, with a broad bay opening into it. It extended east and west, and we named it Santa Elena.
The bay is still known by that name. Not much has changed here, except for the traffic. This is one of the richest fishing areas of the South Atlantic, and early January finds many ships in the bay, testing their equipment in preparation for the coming season. For Degawa and his men, St. Helena provided a much needed opportunity to clean their ships and take on provisions. They had been at sea for three months, covering 5,000 miles and yet made landfall just 100 miles north of the Cape. In the history of maritime exploration, this was nothing less than a triumph. Value took the time to describe the area. The birds of the country are the same as in Portugal, he wrote, and include cormorants, gulls, doves, and many others. The climate is healthy and temperate and produces good herbage. But there wasn't a great deal of time to enjoy it. The fleet had a long way to go, and the wind was blowing hard from the south. After a week's stay, the ships lifted anchor. Beating into the wind, they made slow progress but the profile of Table Mountain in the distance made clear that they were nearing the Cape. Soon it would become a welcome landmark for all sailors heading to the east. Today, Table Mountain is better known for the city that was built at its base. It is also the starting point for most journeys along the South African coast. Right east from Cape Town towards places like Port Elizabeth, East London and Durban ranks as one of the great scenic rides in all of Africa. But for the Portuguese fleet making its way along the coast here 500 years ago, the journey was decisively less comfortable. Battered by contrary winds, the ships took nearly a week just around the Cape of Good Hope. Fortunately, after the Cape, the weather improved, and the fleet's progress picked up. It set course for a place it already knew of. Mussel Bay earned its place in history as the site of the first European landfall in South Africa. It remains proud of that role. There are Portuguese street and place names, as well as the tree, where according to tradition, Portuguese navigators would leave their mail. Right in front of it is a statue of the man who started it all, Bartolomeo Diaz, who discovered the Cape of Good Hope. He gets to look out over the Diaz Museum, which features a full-scale replica of one of his ships. But keeping big ships in dry museums is not an easy task. Yes. So uh, I don't know, it's uh, probably the extra weight. We, we talked about the dust on the sails, particularly what has been broken before. Graham Belcross broken, is former curator of the museum. He has long been fascinated with Portugal's exploits in the area. In the days they built these caravans, they never seasoned the timber properly. The result is cracks, not only on the, on the, on the mast, but on the rudder as well. When Diaz got back to Portugal, he, he, he had to put in a report of his voyage, and, and the report is that this was a good place to land. And so when de Gama rounded the Cape, he headed for Mossel Bay, because here he knew was a place he could land and get water and food. 
He stayed here for a total of 13 days. And it was only after about a week that they saw anything at all of the local inhabitants, who were Khoi. The meeting with the Khoi, or Hottentots, proceeded well, but soon the Portuguese began to wear out their welcome. A small skirmish ensued. No one was hurt, but it set a bad precedent. Shortly thereafter, da Gama decided to head on. The storeship was burned, and the remaining three ships set a course toward the east. I think one of the great tragedies of, of the early Portuguese exploration was their contact with the indigenous people. Because they had no common language, they couldn't communicate. And so it was almost inevitable that there would be conflict. Da Gama and his fleet sailed on, in sight of a coast so spectacular that today it is touted as a highlight of any trip to South Africa. The country about here is very charming and well-wooded, Velio observed. We saw much cattle, and the further we advanced, the more did the character of the country improve. But the weather was not very cooperative. Cloudy weather also forecast for Port Elizabeth, 17 with a high of 25. East London cloudy with some rain, clearing partially, a bit later on, 19 to 25. Velio speaks of a great storm, quickly followed by long calms. And unbeknownst to the fleet, the currents were playing havoc with its progress. Near Cross Island, the fleet was actually driven back for 200 miles, unable to make headway into the strong Agulhas current. Even so, it didn't halt here, assuming the region was sparsely inhabited. Yet if they had just ventured inland a bit, they would have encountered a wealth of life none of them had ever seen. There were also people here, quite unlike the Khoi of earlier encounters. People with a culture all their own. Today the region's name commemorates that time, KwaZulu, or Land of the Zulu, and Natal, the Portuguese word for Christmas, after the fact that da Gama and his men sailed along its coast on Christmas Day, 1497. They were now in unknown territory, having passed Diaz's furthest landfall. The coast had turned sharply towards the northeast, towards the Indies, da Gama hoped but strong coastal currents forced the fleet to stay far out to sea. It wouldn't make for land again until well into today's Mozambique. Until recently, Mozambique was paralyzed by a devastating civil war but its capital escaped the carnage. Most of its buildings were unaffected, including those that remind of its Portuguese connections. Yet in Maputo, these connections would come much later. The first contact between Europeans and the local inhabitants occurred farther north, in the province of Inhambani.
There was a time when trains rode all the way into Inyambani, but the time is no more. The war thoroughly destroyed much of Mozambique's infrastructure. Inyambani carries the scars of the conflict, but here too there's plenty left to reveal the city's Portuguese ties. In fact, Inyambani was more than a regional center. According to the colonial government, it was here that Vasco da Gama's fleet made its first landfall along the East African coast. The statue that once honored him has been relegated to a local backyard because these types of things are not high on the government's list of priorities. Besides, not everyone agrees with the claim that da Gama landed here. According to historian Candido Teixeira, da Gama and his men probably arrived somewhere else. I am preparing a study about the history of Inhamban in the 18th century and one of the main problems deals with navigation. The entrance and exit of the bay demand precise knowledge of its channels, currents, tides and winds. And I'm studying these factors firsthand to see if it is possible to better understand the difficulties of 18th century navigation in this region. There is no better way to learn about these difficulties than by asking the people who live with them day after day. Quais são os principais ventos que há aqui na na Bahia? Quatro. Siga, Ronga, Imandre, Kubutan. Desses quatro ventos, qual é o mais perigoso? É Imandre. Imandre é o mais perigoso. Sim. Não é fácil. It is not easy to determine where Vasco da Gama actually landed and where the crews obtained fresh water. The studies made by some experts reject the hypothesis that Vasco da Gama landed in Inhamban because it's very difficult for someone who doesn't know the entrance to this bay. It is very difficult to enter and even worse to find water. For this reason, I think that Vasco da Gama's crew must have landed in the Poelela Lagoon and that they obtained their water supplies in the Inyarim River. The lagoon and river still look much the way the Portuguese first saw it. Da Gama's men called it the Copper River, after the natives' custom to wear copper ornaments. But the region also got another name. Impressed with the friendliness of the people, the Portuguese called it the Terra de Boa Gente, the land of the good people. Traveling through this region, one gets the impression that people still deserve that description. Many of them have suffered greatly, but there are always welcoming smiles. And though they have few possessions, they are the first to share them. Perhaps it has something to do with the surroundings. Though poor, Mozambique is a stunning country. Or perhaps the good people know something we have long forgotten. After taking in provisions and fresh water, da Gama and his men continued their way, setting a course north along the coast. On Monday, we discovered a low coast thickly wooded with tall trees. Continuing our course, we perceived the broad mouth of a river. As it was necessary to find out where we were, we cast anchor. The country is low and marshy and covered with tall trees yielding an abundance of various fruits which the inhabitants eat. Near today's Kelimane, the fleet halted for a month. Here too, the natives treated their unexpected visitors with kindness. More importantly, some of them asserted that they had seen great ships manned by light-skinned men. This could only mean they were nearing an important place.
Gama had reached the island of Mozambique, one of a string of independent city-states along the East African coast. But Mozambique was Muslim territory. Though its inhabitants were cordial at first, they grew hostile after finding out they were dealing with Christians. The fleet spent nearly four weeks in and around Mozambique, provisioning and trying to collect information on what lay ahead. It proved difficult. Eventually, the situation grew so tense that da Gama decided to move on. But the Portuguese would soon be back. Mozambique Island was extremely well located as a provisioning port on the India run, so troops were sent to take the city and establish a base. Though it was an unhealthy place, they would build it into a splendid city, dominated by a massive fortress. But before anything else, they constructed the small chapel of Our Lady of Beluarte. The location of the chapel on the island is interesting because it was the first building which was constructed here. It shows that the settlers were willing to put their religion and faith ahead of their weapons. French architect Jurek Hodaye is supervising the restoration of the small chapel. Ah, okay. Having lived on the island for more than a year, he has witnessed its gradual deterioration. The island is quite ill. For a good number of years there have been many people who have made reports on its health, most of them prescribing a good many remedies. But over the past 20 years very few buildings have in fact been restored, and in that time the damage has been great. The war's refugees live amidst the ruins and continue to deplete them because they need wood or building materials. We must not forget that there are about 10,000 people living here. They are Mozambicans and this is their island. The island's cultural heritage is a symbol of sorts of the Portuguese occupation. So like the destruction of the Bastille, the disappearance of the remnants of that occupation is a bit like history revenging itself. Even so, Mozambique Island will survive. Next to the bygone glory of the colonial town is a simpler way of life, with lighthouses ingeniously constructed of local materials. They were here long before the Portuguese ever came, and will remain well into the future, because resilience is not measured by the strength of a building's walls, but by the spirit of the people that live there. In late March, Da Gama and his fleet sailed on. To help guide them along the coast, they captured a local pilot. But he didn't prove very reliable. On Sunday, April 1st, we came to some islands close to the mainland. The first of these we called Island of the Flogged One because of the flogging inflicted upon our Moorish pilot, who had lied to the captain by stating that these islands were the mainland. These islands are numerous and we were unable to distinguish one from the other. They are inhabited. On Wednesday, the 4th of April, we made sail to the northwest and before noon we sighted an extensive country and two islands close to it, surrounded with shoals. We maneuvered all day in the hope of fetching these islands, but in vain for the wind was too strong for us. After this, we thought it best to bear away for a city called Mombasa, 
reported to be four days ahead of us. Da Gama and his men hadn't missed much. Though the local pilot informed them that the island was Christian, it was the Moor city of Kilwa. It was unlikely they would have received the cordial welcome they had been led to expect. So the fleet sailed on, past Zanzibar and Pemba, and other great trading centers that had been served by the ancient Dao trade for hundreds of years. Neither Da Gama nor his captains knew. They set course for Mombasa instead, hoping to finally sail into friendlier waters. There are still Dows linking the old trading centers along the East African coast, but they're part of a slowly dying breed. There's no way they can compete with the modern vessels that link these ports as well. So the old port of Mombasa is but a shadow of its former self. But it is still interesting. This is where Da Gama would have come. And like then, there's still some Indian traffic. Indian dhows unloading confirmed to the Portuguese that they were heading the right way. But Mombasa too was a Moorish port. Though its markets had everything the Portuguese desperately sought, they were off limits. So Da Gama was forced to leave again. But here too, the Portuguese would come back in force building the massive Fort Jesus, and thereby leaving signs of their presence on land, as well as underwater. This is a very, very good example of a real successful conservation, as far as I'm concerned. I'm very impressed with this piece. Do you think that uh, we may be able to help other regions? And uh, what is the long-term plan? The long-term plans as an institution in, uh, include putting... The deputy director of the Kenyan National Museums, Dr. George Abungu, frequently checks progress on the conservation of artifacts from the Mombasa wreck, a Portuguese ship that sank here in 1697. To perhaps uh, uh, excavate a ship that sank there for some time. Yes. So we might as well uh, be involved in such a, a project. I think that is quite a... Dr. Abungu used to direct Fort Jesus. Fort Jesus, to me, he is the most important and the best of the late 16th century military architecture of the entire East African coast. It is a magnificent structure with walls as thick as two meters. It is built on solid coral rock with bastions on the four sides. The fort itself was impregnable. In the days when we did not have any explosives, it was not even possible to think of taking the fort by force. Out of the nine times that the fort was under siege, only once in 1875 that it was taken over by force through explosives by the British men of war. Otherwise, it was through trickery, it was through negotiation, or it was taken through diversion. It's an ingenious example of military architecture at its best. But the Portuguese left more than impressive military structures. The arrival of the Portuguese in East Africa, and Kenya in particular, had dramatic changes. They were dramatic because they introduced changes whereby the original controllers, the middlemen, found themselves losing out in the commercial transactions. And so the Kenyan coast is littered with the remains of communities that ended up on the wrong side of the bargain. Places like Matuape, Jumba la Matwana, and especially Gedi, all of them once thriving cities. These settlements had been in existence for hundreds of years. They had coexisted, they had welcomed visitors both from the interior of Africa and visitors from the Arabian Peninsula and India. Everybody benefited, the Swahili people being in the middle, trading directly with the Arabs on one hand and the interior on one hand. So the balance was there. But when the Portuguese arrived, with their notion of taking control of the commerce of the Indian Ocean and trying to Christianize the people of this region, the relation from the beginning was that of conflict. And this is a clear testimony to the numerous resistances, starting down from Sofala to Kilwa to Mombasa, 
which only left the Portuguese with one good friend in Malindi. After a short stay near Mombasa, Da Gama headed on, without a clue this time as to what he would encounter next. From local sailors, he found out there was another trading center, just 60 miles to the north. Despite the hostility encountered elsewhere, Da Gama decided to halt here. It proved a wise decision. Malindi was the one place which actually welcomed the Portuguese in this part of the world. A bitter rival of the ruler of Mombasa, its sultan accommodated the fleet, provisioned it, and most importantly, provided a pilot to guide it to India. So it was from here that da Gama set out across the Indian Ocean. To mark the occasion, he erected a pillar. Then, the fleet headed into the rising sun for the last leg of its voyage. We left Melindi on Tuesday, the 24th of April, for a city called Calicut, with the pilot whom the king had given us. The coast there runs north and south, and the land encloses a huge bay with a strait. On the following Sunday, we once more saw the North Star, which we had not seen for a long time. On Friday the 18th of May, after having seen no land for 23 days, we sighted lofty mountains, and having sailed all this time before the wind, we could not have made less than 2,000 miles. The land, when first sighted, was at a distance of 25 miles. That same night, we took a course to the south, southwest, so as to get away from the coast. On the following day, we again approached the land, but owing to the heavy rain and the thunderstorm, our pilot was unable to identify the exact locality. On Sunday, we found ourselves close to some mountains, and when we were near enough for the pilot to recognize them, he told us that they were above Calicut and that this was the country we desired to go. This indeed was the country they desired to go. More than 10 months after leaving Lisbon, da Gama and his men were within sight of the land of silks and spices, a land Europeans had sought to reach for a very long time. It was near here, a few miles north of Calicut, that the fleet first anchored. Da Gama would be hard pressed to recognize the site today, though the timeless morning scenes that unfold not far away might seem familiar. And just beyond are palm groves, where time has managed to stand still as well. Much of it was strange and unfamiliar, but Europeans believed that the Indians were Christians like themselves. As a result, the Portuguese expected a warm welcome. Velho was one of the first men ashore, accompanying da Gama on his way to a meeting with the ruler of Calicut. 
He described the river they had to cross to reach the city, as well as the first building they were asked to enter. When we arrived, they took us to a large church, and this is what we saw. The body of the church is as large as a monastery, all built of hewn stone and covered with tiles. At the main entrance rises a pillar of bronze as high as a mast, on top of which was perched a bird. In addition to this, there was another pillar as high as a man and very stout. In the center of the body of the church rose a chapel, all built of hewn stone with a bronze door and stone steps leading up to it. Within this sanctuary was a small image which they said represented Our Lady. Along the walls by the main entrance hung several small bells. Many saints were painted on the walls of the church wearing crowns. They were painted variously with teeth protruding an inch from the mouth and four or five arms. In this church, the Captain Major said his prayers, and we with him. Despite these strange-looking saints, the Portuguese held on to their stubborn belief that the Indians were Christians, and hence allies against Islam. They were wrong. This was a very different religion and a very different culture altogether. A culture with traditions so exotic that it was consistently misunderstood by the Western visitors. Though it welcomed them at first, it didn't take long for this welcome to be worn out. Calicut had plenty of pepper and all of the spices the Portuguese sought, but the trade was in Muslim hands. They realized that the Portuguese represented a threat to their own commerce and did whatever possible to obstruct da Gama's dealings with the Indians and they succeeded. Muslim opposition ruled out any serious trade. Tagama's men were relegated to visiting Calicut's markets in small groups in order to procure provisions and small quantities of spices. It was an interesting but disappointing experience. The textiles they took along to trade fetched but a fraction of their worth. After all, Calicut was a major textile center itself, known throughout the East for its calico cloth and linen. After spending three frustrating months near Calicut, Da Gama was forced to leave with no more than a handful of spices. Yet no one could prevent him from returning with information, a cargo that fit in the mind of a single man. A cargo the Portuguese would make good use of in the years ahead, provided it could be brought back safely. Owing to frequent calms, it took us three months less three days to cross the Arabian Sea, and all our people again suffered from their gums, which grew over their teeth so that they could not eat. Their legs also swelled in other parts of the body, and these swellings spread until the sufferer died without exhibiting symptoms of any other disease. Thirty of our men died in this manner, an equal number having died previously, and those able to navigate each ship were only seven or eight. I assure you if this state of affairs had continued for another fortnight, there would have been no men at all to navigate the ships. The captains had held counsel, and they agreed that if a favorable wind enabled us, we would return to India. But it pleased God in his mercy to send us a wind which, in the course of six days, carried us within sight of land, and at this we rejoiced as much as if the land we saw had been Portugal. Bellio covered the remainder of the return in a few lines. Off the West African coast, his account abruptly stops. No one knows what happened to him. The others arrived in Lisbon in the summer of 1499. Only 54 of the original 150 made it back. Despite the cost in lives, another expedition was made ready to sail. It was placed under the command of Pedro Alvarez Cabral. Cabral lost four ships in a terrible storm in the South Atlantic, including one commanded by Bartolomeo Diaz, the discoverer of the Cape of Good Hope. The remainder reached Calicut six months after leaving Lisbon. 
but a confrontation with the city's Muslims forced Cabral to head further south, along the Indian coast. Cabral landed in Cochin, 100 miles south of Calicut. It too dealt in spices, and though smaller than Calicut, was one of its most bitter rivals. In the Portuguese, Cochin's ruler saw a chance to gain the upper hand in the struggle for commercial supremacy. So he allowed Cabral to purchase spices and set up a permanent base. Much the same way spice dealers strike deals today, Portugal and Cochin worked out an arrangement that benefited both. Cochin, because it grew in size and importance, and the Portuguese, because they had gained a foothold in India. In fact, here in Cochin, they would establish the first building block of the estate of India, as it would become known. An estate they would defend with all their might. Though they have long departed, the Portuguese left plenty of signs of their presence. There are the churches, which look as if they were transplanted from southern Europe. There are Cochin's Chinese fishing nets, brought here in all likelihood by Portuguese settlers from Macau. And last but not least, there are the people themselves. I'm very, very proud of the Port Portuguese heritage, and uh, this is why we still re retain Professor John teaches history at the University of Calicut. We don't have many uh, Portuguese records available in Kerala, either in Cochin or Calicut or in any other Portuguese settlements. So we thought of coming here and uh, collect uh, first-hand information with regard to the Portuguese heritage in Kerala. Mr. Payne, is one of the Portuguese descendants who is living here and he knows a lot about the Portuguese uh, history and influences. You know very many Portuguese songs, but one song that I like the most is the song that reflects the poverty of the people. A lament for hard times, the song reflects Portugal's changing fortunes. But India too was affected by the influx of foreign visitors. The arrival of the Portuguese uh, marks the beginning of colonial period in India. And uh, we as Indians, we don't like the colonialism. We are very much against it. But there is another side of this colonialism. In spite of all the drawbacks, uh, it uh, opened the door of Europe uh, to Asia, and a kind of bridge was established between Europe and uh, Asia. And that marked a lot of changes. As far as India is concerned, the major changes began to take place in the Indian subcontinent with the arrival of the Europeans. An egalitarian uh, social system was brought uh, about by the with the arrival of the Portuguese uh, along with the missionaries, the Christian missionaries. So uh, definitely uh, the arrival of the Vasco da Gama in 1498 is a very significant event in the history of India. Cochin would be equally important to the man who started it all. Appointed Viceroy of the Estate of India, Vasco da Gama arrived here in 1524. Exhausted by the task and the climate, he died on Christmas Eve that year and was buried in the Church of St. Francis. A few years later, his body was returned to the town of Vidigueros in Portugal. And a hundred years ago, he was moved once more to the magnificent monastery of Geronimos, 
just outside of Lisbon. Located just steps from his departure site, it seems an appropriate place. Every person who's larger than life in other people's imagination has a legend. This doesn't mean that the legend goes against the reality, but the reality is magnified and as sometimes happens in processes of magnification, distorted or transformed. And so it is with da Gama's grave, a 19th century monument to Portugal's most famous son. A man about whom, according to historian Sanjay Subramanian, we know remarkably little. But this man is very, very distant from us really when we get down to taking his mentality apart. He never left anything very substantial in terms of writing, so we can't actually hear his voice very clearly. You can hear what other people thought about him, but his own writings are very, very few. So here rests a man, not known for his words or thoughts, but for a voyage. A voyage that forever changed East and West.